Hi, I'm Rick Drum, and I'm on Musicians on the Record. Hit it, Dave. Bring it on. Hi, welcome to Musicians on the Record. I'm David Ward. You've heard the music, now hear their story. And this guy's got one heck of a story. We're talking about the business of music today. On the show, the founder and president of Traction Business Coaching, Rick Drum, is on the show. Welcome, Rick. Thank you, Dave. It's great to be here. Great to have you. Now, let me run down this a little bit here because you have a pretty amazing story. Some of my research is uh, from what I uh, found out. You've been in the music product business for over almost 35 years. Uh, president of Dodario and Company, Vic Firth, CEO of Midco, and for Remo. And you've got a pretty amazing drum story as well. You're a drummer and uh, studied with Ed Shaughnessy, Sonny Igo, and played for Barnum and Bailey. Is that correct? That's all correct. That's yeah, amazing. I've, had, I've been very fortunate uh, in my career in different aspects of it. I kind of call it uh, Rick Drum 1.0, Rick Drum 2.0, and now I'm in Rick Drum 3.0. That sounds great. And so what is 3.0? Well, 3.0 is traction business coaching. And what I do is I work with business owners and their leadership teams, helping them get what they want out of their companies. And so I have clients in the music industry. Like, for example, Sabian is one of my clients. Uh, a couple of music retailers um, are my clients. And then I have a number of companies outside the music industry. So what I've been able to do is take all the experience that I learned as I was in the music business and then also add that to a complete system of simple tools mm -hmm. that is called the um, entrepreneurial operating system and it is described uh, in this book called traction written by gino wickman and gino is kind of like an ed shaughnessy or sunny Igo, mm -hmm. but in terms of in terms of business so this system has been implemented into over 3,000 companies in the United States alone, and uh, I'm having a blast doing it. I, I'm wondering also, can we, I want to talk about how you got into the business uh, of music from the drumming, but can we go back to the beginning of uh, when did you first fall in love with music and the drums? I would say probably almost from day one, because uh, my father, Ronnie, uh, is a trumpet player and had a big band. So some of my earliest memories are of going to those big band rehearsals and uh, just being fascinated with everything that had to do with the band and the music. And actually, I started on trumpet at the age of four. All right. Um, and, you know, studying with my dad. Wow. And then I switched over to drums uh, at the age of eight. And the reason that I switched over to drums was because at a family outing, I broke my arm. Oh, no. <laughs> and as, uh, after I got the cast off my arm, my father thought that maybe uh, playing the drums would be good rehab mm. for my arm. Good and idea. what happened was for a while I was playing both trumpet and drums and uh, I just fell completely in love with the drums. Mm. And I can probably still play a C scale <laughs> on the trumpet, but that, that's it. That's, it. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of gone now, but, but that's, still. Oh, that's gone. Yeah, that lip is shot. <laughs> <laughs> and what was it about the drums, Rick, that really just caught you, that really attracted you? It was, I think, an early realization that the, the drums – drove the band mm -hmm. it was core to everything that was going on yeah 
And that, that fascinated me. Yeah. And, and for you, early influences for drummers or musicians in general? Uh, well, going way back, I mean, uh, from the beginning, I'd have to say, um, of course, Buddy Rich, uh, Roy McCurdy, Philly Joe Jones. Um, then as I got older, Tony Williams, yeah. right? And um, uh, later on in life, I became very good friends with Billy Higgins. Yeah, you know, so it was just a, a, a great group of musicians. Yeah. And then, um, you know, when I actually got into, well, actually, let me go back a little bit. Growing up, I attended shows that my father was performing at, and I would always watch the drummers. And so there was a drummer, I can't remember the guy's last name, unfortunately, but his first name was Mo, and he was a drummer for the Ice Capades. Mm -hmm. And I sat for I don't know how many shows behind Mo, watching him how to do a show, and he would turn around and give me quick little tips on what he was doing and why. It was, it was great. Yeah. And where would your dad play? What, what kind of shows uh, would they be and where? Well, we uh, were based in the Springfield, Massachusetts area. Okay. And at that time, I'm going back to the early 60s, um, Springfield was on a, a route that entertainers would use in Boston, Springfield, Hartford, New Haven, down in New York. That yeah. was pretty much the, the cycle. And um, so my dad was contracting for a lot of those shows. So, I mean, again, some of my earliest memories were watching him play with Bob Hope, mm. uh, Jack Benny, wow. Wayne Newton, all of those things, all of those types of performers. Mm. And then, of course, uh, he contracted for, again, the Ice Capades, the circuses when they came into town. And then any other major shows that came in, my dad was contracting the musicians and was usually leading the band. Wow. So those are some big names for uh, a kid to be able to see and watch and learn from. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It was truly a great experience. I mean, again, I'm extremely fortunate to have had that. Yeah. And is that how your uh, experience with Barnum and Bailey, the circus came about was through your dad? Yeah, actually, um, I started playing uh, Shriner circuses when I was 14. A and then um, the Moscow Circus did their first U.S. tour in 1971. And I was the uh, drummer uh, for the last two cities on that tour in Springfield, Detroit, New York. And uh, I got into the Air Force band some years later. And... Uh, I was finishing up my last year for Uncle Sam, yeah. and uh, my dad called me up and said that the drummer that he had been using gave him a full year's notice. Uh, the guy had been doing the show for six years and wanted to get off the road. Mm -hmm. And so, um, long story short, the Air Force let me out three months early okay. so I could uh, take the gig. Mm -hmm. Wow. And what was that like playing for the circus? That must have been pretty incredible. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, we did 1,100 shows during my two years. Uh, each show was three hours in, in length. And um, back then, we did um, two years, a show would go for two years. And I did the blue unit for Ringling Brothers. Hmm. And uh, the Ringling Brothers had two units the red unit and the blue unit. Okay. And um, uh, the first year you did the show, you did the larger cities like New York, L.A., Chicago. And at that time, we would do 11 weeks at Madison Square Garden. Oh, my God. Or five weeks at the Forum out in L.A. or three weeks in Chicago. So, and then the second year, we did what, what we used to refer to as the rodeo circuit. And that was doing these second and third level cities and it was three days two days three days two days with a travel day in between wow yeah and how old were you at this point you had just gotten out of the air force yeah i was 22 years old 22 yeah. and touring the country yeah 
that tour in the country. Um, again, doing about over 500 shows a year. And amazing, amazing. Yeah, and a lot of playing. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, Dom Famulero, who we both know, obviously, uh, mentioned something about a loose bear story and that we had to talk about that. Can you say more about what that means? I've got lots of circus stories, but Dom really seems to enjoy the bear story the best. <laughs> um, yeah, we were playing the Moscow Circus, okay. and it was a little different setup. First of all, we had a Russian conductor that didn't speak any English. And uh, the setup of the band was such that it was the conductor, and then I was right in front of the conductor. Okay. And then the saxophone section was behind me, mm -hmm. the trombone section was behind them, and then the trumpet section was behind them. And frankly, that's the way I think all setups should be anyway. Right. <laughs> Drummer out front, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what the heck? That's right. <laughs> so so uh, this one night we're doing the show. And there was a, what they call a still trapeze acrobatic act. Yeah. And we were playing some grandiose piece of music. And I'm just concentrating on the artists on the trapeze. I'm doing the roles. I'm catching the tricks as they're happening. And this one night, as I'm doing that, I'm catching the tricks. All of a sudden, the trumpet section drops out. And then the trombone section stops playing, and then the saxophone section is gone, and it's like a drum solo, and there shouldn't be a drum solo. Yeah. So I turn around to look what was about what was going on, and there were two bears mm. fighting where the trombone section used to be. Wow, wow. And what had happened, they, there was a curtain behind the trumpet section, and the next act was what they call a leash act, mm. and there were two bears on very long leashes, no cages. And I guess they had an argument about billing or something. I don't know. They, they got into it and rolled into the trumpet section, the trombone section. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> what did you do? I, I kept playing. I mean, wow. you know. <laughs> what else would you do, right? <laughs> That's great. And you were unscathed, hopefully, right? Well, yeah. We were, yeah, we were on the floor, and the animals were right, right behind us. And, yeah, amazing. Yeah. The trainers came and got them, I take it, right? They did. Thank yeah. Yeah. yeah, thankfully, thankfully. I mean, that must have been an amazing experience, just the circus overall. You know, also when I ask people, you know, who were some of those major influences and teachers that were in your life, not many people tell me that Ed Shaughnessy or Sonny Igo were some of their teachers. Can you say a little bit more about how that came about? Yeah, actually, I, I want to uh, preface that with something because sure. it's kind of relevant okay. right now. You bet. Um, I had studied with local guys in my area, a guy, great drummer by the name of Joe Raish, another great drum teacher by the name of Dominic Dieni, and they had taken me as far as they felt they could take me. And uh, so Joe... Uh, Raish recommended that I study either with um, uh, Shaughnessy or Joe Morello. Mm -hmm. okay. Another great drummer. Yeah. And I ended up um, studying with, with Ed. And I called him up, and Joe had given me a, a referral and a recommendation. And so Ed said that he would take me on as a student. Wow. Now, I could afford a few lessons. Mm -hmm. But what had happened was when I was during the summer of the eighth grade, when I was in the eighth grade, there was a small little article in Downbeat. Hmm. And the article was referencing a travel study grant that was being sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts. Hmm. Okay. I applied yeah. and I won. Wow. Nice. Right, so I didn't tell my parents anything about it. I just got the applications. I filled them out. I sent them in. And I was one of 28 people in the country that was awarded this travel study grant that would allow me to travel down to New York mm. and take my every other week lesson with Ed Shaughnessy. It's amazing. And the thing that's important about that, I was like for $500. And back then, $500 was a lot of money. And I was able to get it twice which allowed me, again, to study with Ed. Great. And if I had not had that, I would not have been able to afford it. Yeah. Right? So um, 
And so, you know, I bring that up now because of everything that's happened in, in Washington. Sure. You know, regarding the arts. Right. And right. I've, I've been fortunate to have had a successful career. And again, if I had not had that, sure. what would the impact have been going Absolutely. forward? Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Does that actually, does that grant or award still exist, Rick? Uh, well, they're getting ready to cut the funding for the NEA, but so, but as far as the travel study grant, I don't know, honestly. Okay. So, um, it was, uh, I used to go down to New York. It was 1969 into the middle of 1971 yeah. when, when the Tonight Show moved from New York out to Los Angeles. Okay. And so I studied uh, with Ed every other week. I would take the, the bus from Springfield, Massachusetts, three and a half hour drive down, or, yeah, drive down to New York, get off the bus, Port Authority, and just kind of hang out on the streets until lesson time. And Ed taught above Henry Adler's music, mm, okay. which, which is no longer in existence. But uh, on that floor, down this hallway, when you, you had, went up two flights of stairs, you got on the second floor, directly to the left was my keyboard mallet teacher, Doug Allen. Oh, wow. Ed Shaughnessy was the first studio. Okay. The next studio from Ed's was Joe Casadas. Mm. The next studio from Joe was Sandy Feldstein. All right. And Sandy had taken the studio over from Saul Goodman, who used to teach Timpani to Vic Firth. Wow. And at the end of the hallway was Sonny Igo. Amazing. Right. So this was all long before Drummers Collective or Musicians Institute. Sure. It was kind of a very unique place to be. Yeah, that's quite a building. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, after I, I go up and take my lesson, it would be about an hour, hour and a half lesson, um, I would walk over to NBC with Ed, mm. uh, over at the Rockefeller Center, Studio 6B. Wow. I'd walk over with him, and then he'd have me sit down behind him. Oh, my God. Back, in the, back in that, at that time, uh, there was a part of the audience that could sit behind the band. Okay. And so... I sat behind Ed every other week for two plus years wow. watching the Tonight Show rehearsals for all the music acts that would come on. And then at, after the show ended, uh, I would go back to Port Authority, get on the bus and go home. And I would take it. This is uh, taking a day off from school every other week too. Yeah. yeah. But the, uh, the guys that were on the band at that time, mm. uh, one of the regular subs was Clark Terry. Uh, another trumpet player, Snooky Young. Wow. Bass player, Richard Davis. Arnie Lawrence on sax. Of course, Tommy Newsom and Doc Severinsen. Sure. And I just got to know all these guys. They got used to seeing this little kid, you know. And uh, Ed would have me work on charts, you know. And I had the vinyl. I had the charts, whatever. And Snooky would come up to me and say, hey, am I on that album? <laughs> <laughs> And then Clark would I'll never, never forget a, a conversation I had with Clark. Uh, he asked me about cymbals. Hmm. You know, what kind of cymbals did I play? What, you know, how thick were they? How did they sound? And then he shared with me that there were certain frequencies that were higher that would really bother him when he was soloing. Oh, wow. So he said, you know, just be aware hmm. that the cymbals aren't just for you as a drummer. They're for all the musicians that you're playing with and try to blend. Such a important great lesson for a 15-year-old kid, you know? Absolutely. Incredible, powerful stuff. I mean, you're getting to watch and learn from these world-class musicians. Who, who else do you remember you know, musically that would come on the show that you got to see? Well, there were a lot, a lot of the singers at the time. I mean, I remember Minnie Ripperton when she first came out, and I don't know how many people remember who Minnie Ripperton sure, was, sure. but... You know, um, there were there were people like um, Ella, and you know, folks. You know, it, it was an incredible lineup of musicians, singers, sure. and um, again, the guys just always were very friendly and willing to share, which also was a great lesson for me. Yeah, yeah. You know? So when the Tonight Show moved out west, um, I contacted Sonny Igo. And Sonny brought me on as a student. 
and I was able to continue another year and a half or so uh, with with Sonny. Amazing. And, you know, until I got out of high school, and it was great. It was just just a, again tremendous experience. I mean, you're, you're talking about some of the most historic musicians ever, really. And for those, I mean, the, some of the names you're mentioning for people, if they don't know, Google it and look it up because they're incredible. And for those who don't know, and you tell me if I'm wrong, Sonny Igo was the musician for Ed Sullivan and the Jackie Gleason show, correct? Yeah, yeah. Sonny was a CBS staff musician, so he turned up on all different kinds of shows. Yeah. There's, a, there's some good stuff out there. Uh, with Sonny playing some of those shows. It's yeah, incredible. It's incredible. What, uh, what were they sort of both like, uh, for Ed and Sonny, and similarities or differences with their teaching styles, Rick? Um, their, their styles were, were a little different. Um, actually, and I would say that of the two, Sonny's expectations were actually a little higher. Okay, okay. I, knew, I had to prepare uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really had to prepare for Sonny. Yeah. Okay. And, and um, I share this story too. And, and uh, uh, Sonny's son, Tommy and I are, are good friends. Yeah. And um, I told Tommy this story some time ago and I had the flu. Okay. Right. And I had a 102 degree temperature. Oh no. And this is the night before my lesson. Thanks. And so I called Sonny and said, Sonny, I've got the flu. I've got a 102 degree temperature. I'm not going to be able to make it tomorrow. Yeah. Sonny said, Rick, let me ask you a question. So are, is it your intention that you're going to make your livelihood as a drummer? I said, well, yeah. He said, so let's say that you have a wife and a four month old baby. Mm-hmm. And the only way, that you're going to make enough money to feed them and clothe them and to put a roof over their heads is that you you have to play. Otherwise you don't make money. He said, are you going to play the gig? I said, yes, absolutely. He said, good. I'll see you tomorrow. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You were expected to be there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I was. (laughs) Right. There you go. Right. So then you mentioned, Rick, that intention to make your living through music. You must have been starting to develop that first dream of what you wanted to do. What was that dream with drumming and music? Well, actually, um, because of watching my father do all those shows, and then, of course, hooking up with Ed Shaughnessy in San Diego, my goal was to be a studio drummer. That's Mm -hmm. what I wanted to be. And so I was training myself to do that i had taken again the keyboard mallets taking some timpani lessons doing the drum set playing as many different styles as i could doing as many different types of shows that i could and um uh, but you know it, once i got out to los angeles after the circus okay. um, i realized that there were just a few guys that were actually doing the majority of the work you know, and it was actually this is how I got into the music products side of the business. Okay. So after I did the two years with Ringland Brothers, my first wife and I moved to back down to Florida, where she's from originally, Sarasota. We lived there for a couple of years, and Sarasota is a beautiful place. It is, yeah. I was playing five or six nights a week with different people around town, and I was also had a, a day job moving lumber for Scotty's. Lumber yard back wow, then. Okay, <laughs> real job, right? Real job, real job. You know, and uh, uh, but I, as much as I like Sarasota, I, I realized that my future was not going to be there, and so we made the decision to move to Los Angeles. Now to back up a little bit, when I was with Ringling Brothers, um, I had received endorsements with the Ludwig Drum Company. Zildjian, nice. um, and Remo. Fantastic. And Remo had approached me, it was Lloyd McCausland, had approached me at, uh, from Remo, who was a VP of director uh, of, uh, excuse me, VP of sales and marketing. He um, uh, asked if he could send me product to test because it was really a great laboratory. Hmm. You know, in that I was actually playing 40 hours a week. 
right? Yeah. And, the, and the sound reinforcement on the drums back then was just one overhead microphone. Wow. You know, so imagine playing Madison Square Garden, 18,000 people per show. Yeah. And one overhead microphone. Amazing. Wow. You know, and I still think that there are acts that I played that are still waiting to hear that cymbal crash arrive. <laughs> Right. It's coming any day. Right? Yeah, I'll be there. So, um, anyways, I was playing hard, and it was a, gr a great uh, testing laboratory. So I would write up reports, send them back to heads, and they'd send me more stuff to test. Nice. And so that's how my relationship with Remo started. So when we moved out to Los Angeles, again, we had a, a newborn baby. It was kind of the Sunny Igo scenario. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, I went to, over to Remo to see if I could get a day job while I was trying to break into LA. Sure. And so um, they were going through a little growth phase and I got a, an entry level job in customer service. Okay. And uh, you know, my dad had a retail store back in the day, so I knew what the retailers wanted and yes. what yeah. the expectations were. And so I started fielding all these customer service calls mm. And I started to become fascinated with what caused the problems that the customers were experiencing. Mm. So I just found myself just being inquisitive, curious, mm. and started to ask questions of the people that I worked with in the factory, in product design, yeah. in packaging, and you know, shipping, and all that stuff. Right. And I became fascinated with all things to do with product development and servicing the, the customer, and, you know, and it was uh, working for a company that provided products for people like me. And it was great to be able to help my fellow drummers. Yes. Yeah. Right. Kind of find their solutions. You bet. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so uh, unexpectedly I found this new passion. Hmm. Now, it didn't mean I had to give up the other passion of playing. Right. right. I didn't. Yep. But I was able to discover this new thing. And so every day I went to work, um, it was an exciting new day. And so I found myself just starting to go in at 6 o'clock in the morning and going home at 6.30, 7 o'clock at night. And that's why I saved my first wife. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That can happen, right? <laughs> right. So anyway, um, but – it was funny because uh, human resources uh, were getting on me about showing up early and leaving late. And I said, look, don't pay me. I just want, I'm just here to learn. And they went to Remo himself wow. and complained about me. Wow. And, and Remo said, leave the kid alone. Right. <laughs> he's fine. Yeah. He's doing so, a great job, right? <laughs> yeah. So Remo kind of took me under his wing hmm. and he saw my enthusiasm. He saw my interest. He saw that I was willing to just get things done and if necessary, ask for forgiveness later, you right. know? Right. Yeah. And uh, so he started giving me more and more responsibility. Mm. And so this one day I'm at my desk. He said, Hey, Rick, come here. I want to talk to you. So I've been thinking we should be doing more clinics. I said, yeah, Remo, mm. I agree. With you. That's great. He said, well, and this is when we, we had the, the pre-tuned drum system. We had just come out with that. Okay. He said, so I think we should uh, uh, do a clinic for PTS. I said, great. I said, uh, where? He said, I think it should be in New York City. Okay. Right? Uh, who, who, who are we going to have on it? He said, I think we should have Louis Belson, Billy Cobham, and Vic Firth. Wow. Oh, wow. That's a hell of a lineup, Remo. Sure. When are we going to do it? He said, I think we should do it in 30 days. I said, fantastic. He said, great. Put it together. Oh, man. Yeah. No pressure I, there. No pressure. So I had, been, I had been to one clinic by that time, and yeah. it was a Roy Burns clinic. Wow. Yeah. You know, back when he was doing Rogers and Peisty. Yeah. And so that's all I knew about drum clinics. But I figured it out quickly. I figured, okay. I, got, I called the hotel, the Sheraton Center in New York. Got the, got the location. Uh, I used to be, I, I knew I had to get people there. So I, I made signs and sent them to Manny's and Sam Ash and amazing, you know, the stores out there. And then 
I used to be a, a member of uh, Local 802, the Musicians Union, and I knew back then they had a voicemail system where you could call and just leave a message like for all the drummers. Oh, wow. And so I, I did that. And then I got Remo's Rolodex. Mm -hmm. and for those of you that don't remember what a Rolodex is, just think of a bunch of index cards That's all right. in a circle. Right. Paper still, right? Paper, paper. And I started calling. I called Max Roach. I called Mel Lewis. Mm -hmm. I called Elvin Jones. Wow. I called uh, Sonny Igo. I called, you know, uh, Charles, Charles Perry, Charles Persip. Uh, I mean, all those great teachers from New York and all the players that I knew of. Legends. Yeah. yeah. And um, so we show up to New York and it's the day of the event. And everybody that I called, with the exception of Elvin, who told me he wasn't going to be able to make it because he was on the road, showed up. Wow. Amazing. And Remo said, what the hell did you do? <laughs> How did you do this? Right. You know, and so I, I went through the steps with yeah. him and he said, okay, you're artist relations manager. Yeah, there you go, <laughs> right? You got the gig, right? Right. So from there I went to, uh, you know, over time I rose through the company until I became director of sales and marketing mm. globally for the company. Amazing. And you know, that's to me, that's also such a really powerful story, whether you're a company or individual musician, the power of networking, because that's really what yeah. you did, right? You called right. people, you, you asked them, right? right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I asked for their help. Right. Yes. You know, and, and you'll be surprised that, you know, if people see that you're honest and sincere, how many people will be willing to help? Absolutely. You know, amazing. Right. And so you, you go from the Remo company to Daddario? No, uh, from Remo, um, I had been with Remo for 13 years. Uh, I had moved to, he had me move to San Antonio to run an operation there for him. Okay. Then he, he wanted me to move back to Los Angeles. Uh, my wife, my second wife and I did not want to do that. And okay. we've had enough of living in the LA area. And so, um, one of our customers, Midco International, had been looking for a chief executive officer to manage their company. And so they uh, approached me to see if I would be interested in doing that. And I was. And so we made that move to Effingham, Illinois. Mm. Um, and every time you say the word Effingham, people think you're angry, but right. you're really not. It's the name of the town. Why did you swear at me, Ray? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, so I, uh, we did that for three years. And then um, I was at a Percussive Arts Society convention. And uh, at that time at Mitco, we were, one of the products we were importing was this line of African drums that we were importing out of Ghana. Um, and so I had set up a small booth at PAS mm -hmm. and we were showing the drums. I went and got a cup of coffee. Uh -huh. Now I'm walking back to my booth with my cup of coffee and in the middle of the aisle stands Vic Firth mm -hmm. and Vic says, Hey Rick, how you doing? I said, Vic, I'm doing great. How about you? Yeah, I'm doing great. Listen, let me hit you with something out of left field. How would you like to become president of my companies and come manage my companies for me? Wow. Just like that. I said, well, you know, maybe we could find a room, we could buy dinner, you know, right. we could talk about it a little right. bit. <laughs> <laughs> so and, um, anyway, it took us about a year to, for me to make that move because I had Mitco involved yeah. in some different business things that I didn't feel I could walk away from. Sure. And so, um, Beginning of uh, 2005, uh, or the middle of 2005 is when I joined Vic mm. company. We moved up to the Boston area and uh, managed Vic's company for a little over nine years. Amazing. And, and then um, I got a call from a recruiting firm and asked if I would be interested in looking into D'Addario to become president of that company. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, uh, and that uh, was at the beginning of 2006, mm -hmm. uh, January of 2006, and I left that company at the end of 2013. Then I started my company, Traction Business Coaching. Traction Business, yes. And I definitely want to talk about that too. But first, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
No, one of the things I was going to mention. Yeah. One of the things that I haven't mentioned throughout that entire story is college. Mm. Okay. So I find myself ending up as being director of marketing and sales at Remo, okay. CEO of Midco, president of Vic First, and I don't have any college. Okay. All right. And, and actually, um, a little piece I forgot to mention, during my junior year of high school, I'd actually won a full boat scholarship for North Texas State University, wow. which I didn't take them up on. In I music? passed on it. Yeah, it was music. Yeah, it was a, a performance scholarship. And wow. anyway, um, right out of school, I got a gig. And I figure, well, why do I don't need to go to college? Because I'm actually doing what I'm going to get a degree for. And, you know, at 18, anyway, you know everything at 18. Of course, right? exactly. That's right. That's <laughs> got the world, right? Yeah. Yeah, I got it, yeah. So anyway, um, about halfway through my time at Vic, I uh, did a review of where the holes were in my database. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, decided that I should go to college. Okay. And uh, so I went and got my um, undergrad degree at Southern New Hampshire University okay. while I was managing Vic. Amazing. And then um, the thing that I discovered was that literally everything that I learned, I could use the next day because these were no longer abstract concepts. I had the experience. I knew where to put all this information Absolutely. and how to use it. Great. And then I just decided to continue on and, and pursue my MBA, which I got at the age of 52 from right. Babson College. That's fantastic. You know, which is great school for entrepreneurship, number one college for entrepreneurship. Absolutely. And Vic, I imagine, was very supportive of you going back to school and getting your degree? He was. He was very, very helpful. And he was trying to talk me into doing Harvard, mm -hmm. but... Um, yeah. I'm not sure they would have ever taken me. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to get in, I've heard, right? There are a lot of, there are a lot of smart guys. Yeah, yeah, but, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the, I mean, the bottom line was is that they didn't have a program that was going to fit for me and still allow me to, yeah. uh, you know, manage a company sure. and get my education. So but Babson did. Yeah. And, um, again, Babson is the number one school in the country for entrepreneurship. So it was actually a great fit. Yeah. It was a program where – even if I was traveling, I could take some of those classes. It's incredible. And it was uh, just a, a tremendous experience. It's wonderful. You know, for those folks who don't know, Vic Firth isn't just the name on a stick. He, he was a real guy. And obviously, you got to work with him very closely. Any, any memories or stories about Vic come to mind for you, Rick? Well, you know, the thing about Vic was that, you know, if you, you, you think about entrepreneurs mm. and what an entrepreneur does yeah. Vic Vic's dad was also a trumpet player and a band director so we had that in common his nice. dad taught high school up in Maine that's where Vic grew up yes. and Vic um, was an incredible talent an incredible personality um, and he wanted people to grow mm. he, he wanted people to do well um, and he, I think to this date, was the youngest musician to be hired by the Boston Symphony Orchestra. It's incredible. He was hired at the age of 19 while he was a student at the New England Conservatory. Wow. So when he approached me about taking the job of being president of his organization, um, at the time, he's playing with the BSO. He was the percussion chair for the New England Conservatory, and he had the stick company. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Doing pretty well, right? <laughs> yeah, and he also had an eye for hiring good people. Yeah. You know, so uh, besides his two daughters, Kelly and Tracy, he had a great guy by the name of Neil Larrabee, who came out of, uh, well, you went to Boston University, but... Uh, Neil was uh, a great, um, and still may be, um, writer for Drum and Bugle Chorus, for DCI, for, uh, I think he did, he did the Cadets of Bergen County for a long time. Amazing. And Chuck um, Bolton, another great guy. And we, we just had a really good 
group of people there. Yeah. You know? Incredible. Yeah. A good team, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, if you're going to be a good leader, you got to surround yourself with people that are better than you are in some areas. Right. Sure. right? And Vic was really good with that. And I learned that lesson from him. And, and I imagine that all of this business uh, experience has really served you well to develop the traction business coaching. Can you say more about that? And you showed us a book earlier. You know, as I reflected on my career for those uh, 30 some odd years, what I realized was in the case of Remo, mm. in the case of Lowell Samuel, who was the founder of Midco, in the case of Vic, mm. and even the case of Diderio with Jim Diderio and his brother John. Um, the role that I played, or part one of the roles that I played, was helping them build their companies, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, the way that the approach that I took was basically challenging the status quo. Yeah. Sure. Okay. And um, so I, I realized that I had this passion for helping business owners really grow their companies and be the best that they could be. And so when I left Adair at the end of 2013, actually before I left, I decided that I wanted to be a business coach okay. and help all different types of companies. So I've got clients that go everywhere from startups mm. to companies doing tens and tens of millions of dollars. Incredible. You know, in a wide variety of, uh, of industries. Mm. So not just the music business then. No. Product now, my clients right now go from New Brunswick in Canada down to Guatemala City. I have two clients down in Guatemala. Amazing. Worldwide <laughs> then. Yeah. yeah. It's just, you know, and it's the ones in Guatemala, one's a distributor of dental supplies. The other guy's got eight different food franchises. So, you know, all of these skills yeah. that I learned in music yeah. apply. Absolutely. Apply. As a matter of fact, Dom Famulero and I, Mm -hmm. I've started a company called Entrepreneurial Rhythm. Cool. So and, that. Yeah. Yeah. and so um, what we're doing is we're creating a program where we use music as a metaphor for teaching business fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in music, if you're going to be successful at the highest levels, the greatest musicians – still practice those fun they practice scales they're practicing imp improvisation they're practicing all of their fundamentals yes right mm -hmm. in business mm -hmm. we get out of business school nobody practices their, their fundamentals right right so we take these lessons yep. that we learn in music you know let's talk about you know uh taking risks in business. Mm. Well, what greater tool to use than talking about improvisation, mm. right? And right. Putting, your, putting yourself out there right. and be, be willing to investigate these different paths right. that, we, that, that we take as, as soloists. Amazing. Right? Yep. Right. So, and also things like, you know, uh, working as a team. So mm -hmm. think of a string quartet. Think about, you know, how dependent they are and how focused they must be sure. and what what happens when you have a train wreck who takes the lead where's the give and take right yes so absolutely. again all of these lessons that we learn in music right. transfer over into uh business that sounds amazing and so and for people is that out yet rick for people who want to learn about it not yet not, not yet, yet. Right. dom and i have been in development and yes Secret rooms around the country. No. <laughs> <laughs> the secret Zoom meetings as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're also connected with Dom with another organization that I want to talk about, the sessions.org, which is an amazing uh, organization. Can you say a little bit about the sessions? Yeah, the sessions um, was established by Jules Follett, who wrote the book um, Sticks and Skins, yeah. and you know, which is a wonderful coffee table picture book of over 500 drummers and uh you know I, when i first saw the book i said uh, uh jules i think i'm the only drummer that's not in the book hey wait a minute <laughs> <laughs> reprint right hey, 
Yeah. So no, but um, Jules didn't want uh, her impact to stop at the book. You know, and that book's in the Smithsonian, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Country Hall of Fame. You know, and it's it's a great, great, great yeah. book. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that she realized as they were doing these photo sessions is that all these, some of these great drummers had not really benefited economically. Sure. Right? Yep. And so she came up with the concept of creating a program, it's a nonprofit, mm. where we go into universities primarily mm. and talk to the music students about how to be successful in creating a career in the music business. And with the dynamic changes that have taken place over the past 12 years plus, you know, and how much the industry has changed, mm -hmm. um, that's always going to be a moving target. Right. So we talked to them about, hey, listen, you got to keep an open mind, yep. right? And it's not good enough just to be a great musician. Right. You need to be an entrepreneur on top of being a great musician. Yes. Right? Yeah. You've got to get those business chops together. Yes. And you've, it's, you know, you've got to learn how to network. You've got to learn how to communicate so that people can really understand you. You've got to learn how to take risks. Right? right? And then you've got to learn all the, the other stuff. You've got to learn. You've got to be smart with your money. You know, all of these skill sets that back in the day, maybe you had a person to do this or a person to do that. Sure. It's not so much the case now. That's right. Yes. Just to me, that's golden advice right there, Rick, because those really are the top, you know, if you made sort of a top five list of whether you're a musician in the business or a company, it's those things you just mentioned, right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Incredible. With with all of your work in in music and in the music business, what are what are some of the biggest changes you've seen in the business of music? And uh, in addition to what you would just mention, how do people adapt and grow with that? Well, of course, you know, um, I'm going to go back to when I was very young. The shows would come through. They'd hire a band, right? And you like even you play the rodeos, you do the circuses, you do the ice shows, yeah. right? You do all the the general business or casual dates, depending on which coast you're on, right? Right. You know, yeah. And, but you know, weddings, all social functions yeah. would hire musicians. Yes. All right. So that's changed because pe people wanted uh, to hear music nonstop. Uh, they wanted to hear the versions of the music that they liked. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right? And so, you know, DJs enter the, the scene and they kind of take over the yep. wedding market, so to speak. That's right. And then, um, you know, in, in Hollywood, all right, I want to get, I want to go back way back. Okay. Just to show you how long this uh, evolution has been taking place. Okay. 1927, mm -hmm. right, prior to 1927, when you went into a movie theater, to see a movie, you were watching silent movies with all the, the text, right. and the music was being provided by a band, right. an orchestra, or at least an organist right. in the theater. That's right. 1927 hits, and the movie The Jazz Singer comes out, right. and that's the first talkie, yeah. Yeah. and the game changes after that. Right. And I've got copies of advertisements that were taken out by the Musicians Union talking about the evils of Hollywood and, and studio musicians. I see. Right? <laughs> right. Well, we, we, we know how well that worked out. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? You, can't, you can't stop progress. And that's essentially what we're seeing now. You know, when um, uh, MTV came out, yes. you know, that changed the, the dynamic with the artists considerably. You know, I went from talking with artists to talking to attorneys. Right. You know, right. Yeah. That that changed. And also the value of the artists, because now they were being seen in a video as opposed to just being heard on a on an album. That's right. Now that's all transformed to 
we got streaming music yeah. and we don't know who's on the on on the cut right exactly right i mean i remember being a kid and having vinyl yeah. and reading all the liner notes right. right and knowing everything about that session and being fascinated with everything that went into that session yes. that doesn't exist anymore so by not having that there's a lack of awareness yeah. of who's doing what, what, and what musicians were contributing to what projects. Right. right? Yeah. That's kind of sad, isn't it? It, it, it's, it is very sad. And I think also what it does is that it diminishes the value of the brand, yeah. of the musician. Sure. Right. right. So when you listen to Buddy Rich or Louis Belson sure. or Steve Gadd, yeah. when, as soon as you heard their snare drums, you knew right. it was them. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's part, that was part of their brand. That was part of their identity. Right. right? I mean, um, I mean, one of the guys that has that going now, of course, is Keith Carlock. I mean, because Keith has got yeah. his open bass drum sound and amazing drum. Open snare drum sound. You know, it's so when I hear Keith, I, I, when I hear a cut and I hear that sound, I know that's Keith. Right. Mm -hmm. But you don't see those names show up very much on all these different cuts, right. right? Which is which is too bad. And then, so then of course with Napster and everything uh, right. being, you know, uh, changing the, the ex expectation that music should be free. Right. Yeah, where did that come from, huh? Uh, Napster. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But the, the, you know, that that changed it quite a bit. And so now you have an entire generation of people that really feel that music yeah. should be free. Right. Yeah. And so that changes the economic sure. um, viability right. of trying to make a living yes. as a musician. Right. You know, so as a result, the number of musicians is down professionally. Yeah. You know, if you look at the, the numbers of musicians that belong to the Musicians Union, sure. just the number of people that are coming into the industry, some of the, the dynamics that have changed on the music product side of it is that from two, 2005, 2006 was the peak mm. of the percussion business, okay. right? And the last 10, 11 years, mm. the percussion business, the drum set side of it, mm. is about 50% in units and in dollars of what it was back in 2005. Wow. Mm. The guitar, the guitar market is down over 20 some odd percent. The amplifier market is down by 50%. Now, you can make the argument, well, there's more people that are making music. Mm -hmm. Nobody really knows for sure. Mm -hmm. but I do know this. There's less people buying those products. That's those, right. are, those are facts. Yep. They're not alternative facts. Those are facts. <laughs> those are real facts. Uh, right. And so... Um, it means one of two things. Less people are coming into it or they're using different tools to make the music. Okay. Right? right. One of the tools being the thing that you and I are talking on right now, right? right. Our, co our computers. Yes. And that has, again, changed the ability of how we make money. Right. Right. In, yeah. in this industry. Yeah. So in, in your view then, Rick, for musicians or music product companies to continue being successful, where do you think the music business is going and that they can grow and adapt and get ahead of the curve with that? Well, I'm working on a project now. Um, I have uh, an ownership position with two other guys, the name of Kayla Chapman and Andrew Sermani. And we're creating... Um, a company called Caleb Chapman's Soundhouse Performance Studios. Mm -hmm. And Caleb has had his methodology of creating a place to play for the last 18 years. Mm -hmm. and so we are now building three locations across the country, and we're going to franchise that out. And the thinking behind that is this. In the music industry, we have lots of companies that make great products. Yes. Okay. Uh, we have great retailers that know how to sell it, both brick and mortar and online. Right. We have great educators 
that know how to teach how to play the product, yeah. right? And how to play music. Sure. The missing component is the place to play. Mm -hmm. As an industry, we've been very, very dependent on that place to play to be the public school system. The challenge there is, is that music, in many cases, is still being taught the way that it's taught 50 years ago. Right. Not in all cases, but in many cases, sure. it's true. And the programs are not as, in, as inclusive as they could be or should be. Mm -hmm. So a lot of kids get left on the sidelines to try to make their own way. Right. And so we just find this as an opportunity. And so in the uh, Soundhouse Performance Centers, what or studios, what we're doing is we're providing what we call a producer mm. to put the bands together, rehearse the bands, wow. book performances. All right. And, and Kale has been doing this for 18 years out in American Fork, Utah. And he's, he had opened another location in Denver. And so uh, basically what we're talking about is a great place to go play mm. in an environment where you're going to get help. We're not doing private music lessons, but we're providing that place to play and we'll get you with other musicians mm. that share your passion. And so our program is eight to 18, but we have an adult program and we also have an elementary and preschool program. That sounds incredible, Rick. And is are we, uh, I imagine with at least the first three, are we talking East Coast, West Coast, middle of the yeah. country? Yeah, we're looking at Nashville, Denver, and Los Angeles will be the first three. Yeah. And, and how much of what we're doing right here with this technology stuff, computers, how much do you think technology is going to be part of continuing the music business or part of this, what you're talking about? It's going to be part of both. Yeah. All right. So as a matter of fact, yeah, we're going to have a, uh, and we do have a technology module mm -hmm. that, that we teach, you know, music production, digital music production. Yeah. And also songwriting. We have songwriting module. Nice. And, uh, you know, it's for groups. Yeah. And, you know, part of the, the draw is counter to what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And that is, while the technology in some cases has helped us become very productive and in some cases it's helped us become most more social. Yeah. What it's not doing is what it has also done. It has isolated us yes. right from really having face to face, True. right? Person to person conversations in real time. And, there's something to be said for communicating with somebody beyond the thumbs. Right, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Having the face to face, being able to understand the body language, right? Because it's something like 80 or 85% of communicating a message actually is body language. Sure. It's not just what you hear. And so um, with the sound house, basically we're bringing people together. Mm. And while playing the music is fantastic, it's also creating that place where you have social interaction. That's right. With a lot more people that share your passion for making music. That's right. That sounds great. The networking and the music sounds fantastic. So Soundhouse Performance Studios. Yeah. CC Soundhouse Performance Studios. Uh, we're going to be rolling them out at the beginning of 2018. That's great. And like so, we have a site in American Fork, Utah, and another one in Denver. Coming to a town near you—that sounds great. Yeah. Excellent. Good. Yeah. Can I can I also ask uh, for you musically, Rick? I saw you uh, playing uh, a little bit with the clip on the sessions. How much do you still play, and are you do any gigging still? I do some occasional gigging with a great uh, tenor sax player by the name of Frank Catalano okay. out of Chicago. And so sometimes I'll play with Frank in Chicago or New York or in the West Coast. Um, just, you know, on the, some of those special gigs and uh, where our schedules will work. Mm, yeah. Uh, and, but Frank's got another project that he's been doing with Jimmy Chamberlain. Mm. 
Mm, okay. And uh, so he's spending a lot of time with that. And um, they still practice quite often, you know. It's just I can I can still roll for a couple of days, you know. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Excellent. Still working on the fundamentals or anything in, in specific, in particular, that you're practicing these days? This is my daily hand routine. Wow. Tommy Igos, right? Lifetime complete hand maintenance warm up, which came of it, some of it came out of uh, Sunny. Nice. And so, you know, I'm uh, still working on my stuff. <laughs> I love it. Fantastic. I've never seen that before. I got to get a copy of that. That's oh, a that's a, yeah, it's a great, great DVD. And I mean, he's covering uh, everything from beginner all the way through advance. And like I said, I use this almost every day, you know, and then uh, along with the the good old basics, you know. Sticky. Sure. And is that the same as, because I've got some of his videos and his rudiment uh, poster there. Is that the same as, or no? Yeah, this actually is, uh, the uh, Hands for a Lifetime is that, what you're thinking of is the, is the rudiment poster. Got it, got it. And, you know, the Groove Essentials. Yeah, amazing. You know, that was, that came, that came out of a program that we had been doing for Vic. Hmm. We were doing, you know, uh, Neil Larrabee and, um, Mark Wessels uh, at Vic had come up with this great uh, rudiment poster. And I think we'd given away between 50 and 100,000 of these posters. And you know, I said, you know, we need to have something like that for drum set. Yep. And so we started to talk about who, sure. all right, that could pull this off. And Tommy Igo right. was, was the name. And um, I actually think it was Neil that came up with Tommy's name, and I said, "Yeah, I mean, I mean, Tommy, great set player, and also he came out of the rudimental world, okay, and he was also an excellent teacher. So he had the uh, blend of skill sets, yeah. and as it turned out, it was a it was a great project that we had put together first, and then uh, Hudson Music, yeah, um, wanted to re-record everything and do it in the studio." Uh, which uh, which they did, and uh, Tommy did uh, Groove Essentials one, and then two, two, yes, and then uh, yeah, the uh, Hands for a Lifetime. You know, people ask me you know, when I do uh, speaking engagements at universities or anybody will listen, <laughs> but <laughs> they'll ask me uh, what are some of the essential skills that helped me be successful in this industry. And the first one is the most important skill to play music, and that's listening. You got to really learn how to listen, right? And through listening, you're going to, then you, you really need to learn how to communicate and be an active listener as a step close to a passive listener and make sure that people, number one, that you're really listening to them and understanding what they want to say and that they are really hearing what you want to say, mm -hmm. right? So there's techniques that are involved with that. Um, the ability to admit you're wrong. Mm -hmm. The ability to admit to a mistake, own the mistake, and fix it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm fortunate in that throughout my career, um, and believe me, I made tons of mistakes. Um, people allowed me to recover. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, another one is just never stop being curious hmm. be a continual learner and that's something that i learned about myself and you know i've got six books that i'm reading right now yeah. wow. you know, and it's because it's i'm fascinated by the information i'm really i really want to know it yeah. and it's um it's important for me what gets me up every morning so to speak, is that I know that I'm going to learn something new. I need to learn something new every day, hmm. right? And so um, 
and then the, the, the next thing is the ability to understand risk and be willing to take risk. And the last thing, and I'm sure there's a, a number of things that I'm not mentioning right now, but it's the ability to fail, not being afraid to fail, and being able and, and knowing that you can recover from that failure and then w truly learning from that failure. And again, that's one of those things that, you know, if, you, if you're learning how to play music on any instrument, right. you get better, you're going to fail a lot. <laughs> I do all the time. Right? <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, that, that, that scene out of uh, uh, Bird, uh, the movie Bird about Charlie Parker, right? When Joe Jones throws the symbol at Charlie's feet because he's like, his solo is forget about it. It's nowhere close. Right. And, but, you know, so Charlie took that failure and he learned from it and he became Bird. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. That's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. So those are the, those are the big ones. And I think they're important because a lot of people have trouble with those. Absolutely. That's great advice. And, you know, obviously you do a, a lot of coaching and with business, with music. I'm, I'm also a coach and, and therapist. You know, I'm sure you help people with setting goals and, and achieving those goals. I guess lastly, I'm wondering, Rick, what are, what are the goals that you still want to achieve in all of the amazing stuff you've done in the music business so far? What's left for you? A lot, yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, p people ask me, you know, how, you know, how's your business? And I say, unbelievable, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I really mean it. It really is unbelievable because, you know, like I said, I, I just shared with you three different businesses that I'm working on right now yeah. and I'm learning a ton, you know, I'm, all of a sudden I'm immersed in the wonderful world of franchising and what goes into that. Right. And I'm immersed with setting up this program with Dom, you know, on entrepreneurial rhythm. And we've already had some inquiries from a major university in the country that think that this could be a course. Very cool. Right. Yeah. And, and then, um, you know, again, with, with Soundhouse, uh, well, with my traction business coaching, um, I want to build my business up. So I have, majority of my clients here in Atlanta because we're, you know, right now I'm spending a lot of time on the road traveling. You know, it's always, you know, when you become a diamond member of this and that, and you're on a first name basis with some of the TSA folks, right. it means that you're spending too much time traveling. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily the best way to, to, yeah. to live your life, sure. but um, you know, so I have goals that are tied in with traction business coaching. We have goals that are set up for the sound house. And Dom and I have goals that are set up for entrepreneurial rhythm. So in order to achieve those goals, number one, and you know this acronym, they need to be SMART goals. And, all right, so for those that don't know, SMART is an acronym for, you know, that goal's got to be specific. You really got to spell it out, right? And what, it, what does a successful end of this goal look like? Right, it's got to be measurable, right? You got to know that you're doing it on time, so forth. It truly needs to be attainable, yes. right? It's got to be realistic and it's got to be timely, yes. right? So that you can complete it in a uh, a time frame. So the way that I've set up my life is uh, again using the system, uh, the traction business coaching or the entrepreneurial operating system. I set quarterly goals, hmm. right? And for myself, I set maybe three to five, what we call rocks, those big tasks yeah. that we need to achieve in the next 90 days. Nice. And they're really well spelled out. And um, I follow them and, you know, uh, and I hold myself accountable hmm. to executing those rocks, yeah. you know? And then you've got to be really smart with, uh, time management and how you prioritize your time. You, you can't, honestly, you can't waste a lot of time with this thing. Right, right. Oh, I got to call some people. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, 
but it, it's 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 really important that um, you you manage your time carefully. And when I look at those that have been very successful in both business and music, mm -hmm. really good at that. Right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So. And you got to surround yourself with smart, good people like you have with Don Famulero and others. And right. yeah. Rick, thank you so much for your time with all this. This has been incredible. It, this, to me, feels like it's been a music lesson, a history lesson, and a business lesson all in one. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much for your time. This is great. Thank you, Dave.